good morning ladies and gentlemen so today i will be talking to you about how we attempt to balance our roles as doctors as well as parents so i hope i will be able to present some ideas to you so that it might provoke your thought process and help you balance these roles a bit better than we are doing at the moment so when we come home from work usually we have a lot of plans especially nowadays with the covid pandemic with children being at home we want to do a lot of activities with them including their homework so when we go home this is what we envision we want to play with them spend time with them and also do their homework but usually the sit work out this way i guess most of us end up in this sort of situation with the children fighting and we being unable to get the work that we plan to do done and becoming generally frustrated and upset and even sometimes guilty if you know the expression in the parents they appear overwhelmed and frustrated and even guilty so in today's discussion i just um, concentrate on four main areas the first would be i would like to talk about this concept of being a perfect parent because we want to do the best for our kids and then we'll move on to an introduction to attachment based parenting and the third component would be a section on self reflection because that is very important as a, a parent and also as a um, person who's in our general setup in our work environment also and then we'll move on to discuss about what we can do to balance our roles as parents so who is a perfect parent Oops. sorry so who is a perfect parent well we all want to do the best for our kids we want them to say all the right things do all the right things so that they don't um, get hurt and that they achieve the full potential that they are capable of uh, achieving and when we get home from work we want to go from this possibly this this is what we fantasize but is it possible to be a perfect parent so do you think you are a perfect parent i guess you wouldn't participate in today's program if you thought you were so do you know anyone who is a perfect parent or do you know of any relationship which is perfect for that matter so what has been shown is that attempts to become a perfect parent does have its own pitfalls because we are modeling perfection so perfection doesn't actually exist especially in human relationships and if we model perfection if we attempt to model perfection we are like asking a lot from ourselves and we'll pro probably end up being very anxious also and when we are modeling perfection to our children we are just giving the message to them that perfect relationships exist and when they grow older that's what they would expect and when we are trying to be perfect when we are very anxious about our performance as parents we'd be watching our performance rather than looking at our kids and attending to their needs if you had heard of the story of the centipede attempting to count every step so that attempt would end in disaster because then the centipede wouldn't be able to walk obviously so there we can see how attempts to um, be a perfect parent can be very challenging because then we'll just be watching our performance and not looking towards the needs of our children and children pay more attention to our state of mind than to our actions so children are very attuned to what we are feeling so if we are anxious or upset 
uh, then the children are very attuned to that. And they become anxious in, uh, as a response because they are wondering why my parents are upset. And then they also become very anxious and uh, they have difficulty doing their tasks. So if we try to model perfection, if we try to pursue perfection in our relationship with our kids, then we will fall into these traps. And it will be difficult for our children to realize that all human relationships are fraught with these difficult moments and for them to learn to tolerate the frustrations and have the skills necessary to solve the problems that might arise. So if, we, if perfect parenting doesn't exist, where does that leave us? So that's where this concept of good enough parenting, which was introduced by Dr. Winnicott, the pediatrician and psychoanalyst, where he spoke about being and doing the best we can for most of the time. And also if we do like have difficult situations, we need to go back and reflect and solve those problems and repair the damage that was done by certain actions and sayings. So in the concept of good enough parenting acknowledges that we all struggle. I mean, we all have our moments which we are less than proud of and which we'd rather forget, especially in our parenting relationship. Sometimes we would have had that. And then it also acknowledges that no one is perfect. All of us have our difficulties and our flaws. And when we accept our flaws, if we develop the reflective capacity to look at ourselves, then it's easier for us to repair those problems and move on. So this concept of good enough parenting is what we are attempting to achieve and which is healthy for our children as well, because it helps them develop a lot of skills, including tolerating frustration, problem solving skills, and managing interpersonal difficulties. So that is the first section of my lecture where I wanted to focus on this concept of perfect parenting and how we can move on to become a good enough parent. In the next section, I'll speak briefly about attachment-based parenting. So like the name implies, attachment-based parenting is based on attachment theory which was described by Dr. John Bowlby in the 1960s. So he's a British um, child and adolescent psychiatrist. And his theory revolutionized the way that we treat children from um, allowing parents to stay with children during hospital stays to more sophisticated psychoanalytical and attachment-based approaches to dyadic therapy. So he described attachment theory as a last attachment as a lasting psychological connectedness between humans. So please note that it's a lasting connection between humans. And it's an essential human need. So that was the other uh, thing that he stressed about because if you have ever seen a child with psychosocial short stature, you would realize how important it is for a child to have that nurturing relationship. So that attachment relationship is an essential human need. And in the attachment theory, Dr. Bowlby described how this attachment relationship creates a sense of stability and security needed for the child to develop. So it provides a secure base for the child to explore his environment as well as um, when the child feels threatened or when his uh, attachment system is activated, it uh, allows the child to um, receive that comfort and um, satisfaction from the parents. So that secure base is provided by this attachment relationship and this regulates the balance between exploration and security. So I really like this quote from uh, Jude Cassidy, who's a psychologist. So she's saying that secure attachment is knowing that someone has your back 
and knowing someone has your back opens a world of new possibilities so even for us this is true just imagine if you are trying to you know embark on a new venture that your family doesn't approve of or your colleagues your closest colleagues do not approve of then that can be a bit anxiety provoking as opposed to if everyone is supportive of this new venture then it's much easier for us to go forth because this these attachment needs are actually there throughout our lives so just imagine how it would be like for a little child if we were not supportive of the exploration and if the child felt that there was no one sort of having her or his back then it would be very anxiety provoking and they would have uh, problems in become exploring their world as well as feeling secure in their relationships so circle of security is a parenting uh, approach that was developed by three mental health professionals in the USA based on the attachment theory so it's actually a, a graphic representation of the attachment theory which is like which can be translated into practical everyday situations so if you note the first half the top half of the circle you can see the child exploring the world and then the hands on the circle are the parents or the primary caregivers who provide that secure base and then the bottom half of the circle represents uh, the child's need for that emotional support filling my cup so when the child is emotionally um, upset or when he or she wants someone to support he or she will come back to the secure base or safe haven so this uh, graphic representation of um, the attachment theory is easy for us to see how uh, in the top half the child goes out to explore the world and in the bottom half the child comes back to the safe haven when they are feeling threatened so if i were to um, explain in a bit more detail so the same circle with some more details so if you look at the first like the top half that's about the child's need to explore the environment so if children didn't explore the environment around them then they wouldn't learn new things new skills so they need that uh, exploration and they also need support they want to know that someone has their back when they are going out and exploring the environment so if you have ever seen a child in a children's park you can see how when they run off to the swings they would just turn and look back at the parents Oops, sorry so they would just turn and look back at the parents and um they would uh, you know just know that the parents are looking over them watching over them and when they are playing also they might just you know check in with the parents from time to time so when they are exploring children want us to watch over them and they also want us to delight in them that is you know when they do something and they look back in happiness they want us to sort of reciprocate that and at times we might need to help them also but that doesn't mean we are going to take over the whole activity and then we might at times join them in enjoying the activities that they are doing and their exploration so if you move to the bottom half of the circle you can see the child's need to come back to the safe haven or the primary caregivers so this usually happens when their attachment system is activated and when they feel threatened so if we go back to the example of the child playing in the swings in the in the uh, playground when if another child pushes him or if he falls down then they might go running back to the parents because their attachment system is activated with that threat and then when they come back they want the parent to protect them comfort them and help them organize their feelings because sometimes when they are overwhelmed with anger or even like positive feelings like happiness and uh, excitement they might run back to the parents because they want some support to regulate those feelings and it is within this dyadic relationship that children will learn to regulate and organize their feelings so that they are able to do that as adolescents and adults on their own so this bottom half 
represents the coming back. And then the hands of the circle are the parents or the primary caregivers. So they have to be bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind. So we can't be bigger and stronger only. We have to get a balance between all these. And we can't just be kind and you know, let the child do anything they want. So we have to get a balance between these qualities. And whenever possible, the parents need to follow the child's needs, but if needed, they should also take charge. So this taking charge is also important because um, just imagine uh, when you have limitless choices, when you can do anything you want, um, it's very anxiety provoking because you, don't, you want to do the best. And when you have a lot of choices, you don't know what to choose. So your anxiety becomes more. So just imagine for a child, if you don't take charge and give them some direction in situations that where it is necessary, it will be very anxiety provoking for them. So you need to set some limits and boundaries if you are to help them feel safe and secure. So in this um, attachment relationship, if you look at the circle of security cycle, uh, in the top half, things can go wrong, especially if the parents are very anxious. So if they don't allow the child to go and explore because they are worried that the child might hurt themselves or someone else might hurt the child, then that might create difficulties for the child in ter terms of developing his soft skills in exploring his world. And in the bottom half, Sometimes parents are very um, uncomfortable with difficult emotions in their children. So, I mean, there are instances even like most of us do this, especially even like are, we might be very busy or we might have some other commitment. And when our child coming, comes running to us crying because of being busy or because we have difficulty managing their difficult emotions, we might sort of ask them, don't cry, you don't have to cry, there's no need to cry. So we are invalidating their feelings. So when they come to us crying, we should try to acknowledge that yes, they are feeling upset and you know, help them manage that emotion. We don't have to go and fix whatever is wrong and make them feel better, but we need to work with them to accept and manage that emotion and help them develop the skills necessary to solve whatever problem they're having. So the bottom half of the circle might be affected if we have a lot of difficulty managing difficult emotions in our kids. So we need to be open to even the most difficult emotions that our children might be having. Another important thing introduced in the circle of security parenting and or in attachment-based parenting as a whole is this concept called being with. So that means being emotionally available to your child. So most of the time we are there physically, but we might be busy, we might be thinking about other things, and we might not be emotionally attuned to the child's needs. And children are very good at picking that. You know, if we are sort of thinking about something else and they, if they come running to us to show whatever, like maybe an art project or something they have done, then if we do not attend to that, they will definitely. Uh, be able to pick that up. So it's important that we are emotionally attuned and emotionally available for our children. Of course, we can't be 100% available all the time, but we have to try to do this as much as possible. And another concept and another thought that I want to introduce is that a child's behavior is a way of communicating a need. So if our child is throwing a tantrum or behaving in a difficult manner, we have to just try and figure out why. You know, it's often quoted that children are just, you know, behaving badly to get attention. But why do they need attention? Are they, where are they in this circle of security? Are they feeling like, do they want their emotional needs met or do they want some support to explore their world? So we need to find where they are and support their exploration or support their need for comfort. And then in, um, especially when our children are having difficulties, 
we have to always remember, especially in the smaller children and toddlers, that the caregiver is the partner more likely to induce a change in the behavior of our children. Because the children, it's unlikely that little kids would realize that they are behaving badly and change their behavior. So we have to change how we respond to the bad behavior or the challenging behavior in order to induce a change. So I hope you got some idea about the concept of um, attachment-based parenting. So what I wanted to introduce was that it's important to support our children explore their world as well as support them when they have difficult emotions and when they want their emotional needs met. And we have to be emotionally available for them. And when necessary, we have to also take charge and set limits and boundaries. So the third part of the uh, presentation is on self-reflection. So I think Prof. Pianjali D'Souza will also be talking about some of these concepts later on today. But I will uh, present about self-reflection as it um, is important in parenting as well. So it will be brief. So self-reflection is the habit of deliberately paying attention to our own thoughts, emotions, decisions, and behaviors. So I guess we are very good at paying attention to other people's behaviors and thoughts and criticizing and um, assessing and judging. But it's quite difficult for us to look at ourselves because sometimes we might not like what we find. So, but it's important that we develop this capacity because it's important in our relationship with our children. So when we are talking about self-reflection, we can reflect on a past event something that happened in the past so that we can learn where, what we did well and what we didn't do so well, and we can change our behaviors in the future. For example, say you had a very bad day at work, it was very busy, and you had an argument with your colleague, and when you went home, you wanted to uh, do the homework with your daughter, and she just wasn't in a mood and was throwing a tantrum, and you got very angry with her, shouted at her, and you ended up eating a whole tub of ice cream because you felt guilty and upset. So that, uh, sorry. So that uh, chain of events, if we look back and reflect, we might be able to find certain points in that chain of event where we could have thought and acted differently so that we can avoid the same thing in the future because we don't want to sort of end up guilty and upset. For example, when we came home from work because we had a bad day and we knew we were a bit you know, irritable and not in a mood to tolerate our child's tantrum, then maybe we could have you know, put off doing the homework for a little later once we are in a more calmer space. So that sort of uh, adjustment can be done if we reflect on a past event. But self-reflection is even more important if we can use it in real time. I know it's very difficult to do that and it takes a lot of practice. I don't know, like there are some people, there might be some people who's able to do this at least some of the time. So if used in real time, say when you were arguing with your daughter, if you realize that your daughter just wanted to, you know, cuddle up and feel comfortable. And after that, you might be able to get to do her homework with her. Then maybe you could have just given her a cuddle. I mean, it would have helped you also because you were really upset and distressed after a day's work. So that would have changed the course of things and, the, um, and how you reacted to your child. So it's possible to use reflection. Self-reflection is real in real time as well, although difficult. So there are three skills that are important to develop self-reflection. One is openness. Then you have observation and objectivity. So I'll just briefly go through these three. So openness is becoming aware of and free from inherited beliefs and stereotypes that we have about the world as well as ourselves. So sometimes uh, we might not be even aware of certain actions or certain things that we do because that is how we have been doing it for a long time. 
For example, our habit might be just when we get home from work, irrespective of our emotional state, irrespective of our child's emotional state, we start off with the school homework. So we might not even be aware of this habit. So we need to look back and be open and become more aware of these beliefs, habits, and stereotypes. And uh, it's about learning to see things as they are. In observation, that is the ability to watch ourselves and our own mind in the same way that we watch external events. Because like, as I said before, we are pretty good at um, watching others and you know, judging them. But it's, it can be very challenging to look at ourselves, especially with distance and perspective. And objectivity is the other skill we need to cultivate. It's about understanding that we are more than just the content of our thoughts. Because um, we tend to get wrapped up in our thoughts and emotions and we feel that that is who we are. But if you, you know, sort of take a step back, you can see a part of yourself observing these thoughts and emotions. So there's another part to you, not just the thoughts and emotions. So understanding that uh, even though we might have some negative thoughts or feelings, that that doesn't mean that is who we are is important. I mean, uh, an example would be say a person with a, if you have ever seen someone with an obsessive compulsive disorder, they might have very, you know, certain thoughts that are really not in keep, keeping with who they are. For example, they might have this uh, thought to stab someone and they might be perfectly calm and, you know, people who are very uh, non-confrontative. But uh, so that shows that we are not just our thoughts. We are much more than that. And realizing this is also helpful when we are developing our self-reflective capacity. So this uh, ability to reflect on our actions and thoughts and emotions would definitely go a long way into managing the difficult emotions that we experience as parents. And self-care is also important as parents because unless we are in a good space mentally and physically, it's difficult for us to sort of care for someone else, let alone a little human being who's always demanding our attention and care. So we have to focus on ourselves as well, especially in these times of difficulty to develop uh, um, optimal mental and physical well-being. So the last section of my presentation is doctors as parents. So I came across this, some interesting studies. So there was this study done in um, Canada among physician parents in 2009. And they spoke about the um, things that the, um, the female and male physicians have expressed. So female physicians have said that uh, they had to spend more time on childcare and domestic activities. And they have expressed a sense of guilt about their performances as both mothers and doctors. Male physicians have also re expressed regret about the lack of time they have with their family. So they have expressed that lack of time is a problem. And they have also said that they relied on female partners for family responsibility. And few have said that they have positive physician parent role models. By positive physician parent role models, I mean, they, they have meant um, like senior clinicians or senior colleagues who are also parents who are able to support and mentor younger physicians who are trying to balance these roles as parents and doctors. So what is the situation in Sri Lanka? I couldn't find any studies specifically addressing the issues that doctors face as parents. But of course, there were studies about burnout and difficulties experienced by doctors like workload, interpersonal conflicts, administrative issues, lack of personal time, then commitment to studies and um, examinations, and also vicarious traumatization, because like we see a lot of human suffering day in and day out, 
and there is a lot of vicarious traumatization and we do not at the moment have a formal system unfortunately to support this sort of issue and uh, then again most of uh, our doctors have to travel like they are living far from their home so they have these issues as well and um, i just wanted to present this small write up that was done by dr nilanka vikram singh so this was actually i found this in the june 2021 newsletter of the colombo uh, medical students Alum alumni association and i got her permission to uh, like put it up in my lecture so she has expressed how a uh, doctor mother might feel when you know they have these conversations about caring for the children and i just want you to note some of the words that you had used ashamed guilty and you know how we compare our parenting to um parenting of the like other mothers who are not doctors and then our doubts about whether we are too ambitious whether we are too selfish because we are sort of going behind our careers and uh, other achievements so i thought this re resonates a lot with what most of us are feeling and um, that's why i wanted to just put it up so with the covid pandemic we have had um, further challenges like but the madam said in the introduction so there was this um, article in 2020 which spoke about the added teaching responsibilities that we have as parents now and then of course work hours may have changed then due to the covid infections or quarantine things might change and there is a lot of uncertainty and also there are fears among children of healthcare workers so we also have had some uh, children presenting with fears and significant anxiety because they were worried about their parents getting the covid infection so how can we balance these roles so from the initial canadian study that i presented they had some uh, solutions like some ideas uh, were presented so one was part time work and job sharing i know this is not available for us here but with our changing socio cultural situation and you know lack of extended family support i think these might be things that we need to head towards but of course proximity to supportive extended family is important i guess uh, there are some of us who are lucky enough to have that support and then greater commitment to sharing domestic and child care responsibilities and role models and mentors for younger colleagues like i mentioned physician parent role model so that program might also be something that we can look into uh, especially if it's formalized then we could have that added support as younger parents and then in our setting some of the things that were discussed to manage burnout among the doctors were stress management and self care like i described and we might also need to prioritize so we might have to sometimes choose and pick where we are going and then we might need to let go of our guilt because like in lanka's poem there was that uh, thing about feeling guilty about leaving the children with the nanny so sometimes we might have to sort of let go of that and um compromise our um um roles so that compromise in the sense you know come to a um, acceptable compromise between spending time with our kids and our work roles and then accepting and moving on is important because um, sometimes when we have difficulty accepting certain things like if we are too guilty or if we don't think uh, um, we are doing enough for our children we might become really anxious and be unable to function well in either role and like i mentioned learning to reflect on our own feelings and actions goes a long way so during the covid pandemic there are also other things we can do which we can do at other times also but it's even more important now so routine and planning are important because routine gives the child a sense of security because when we are really anxious if we have to do routine things that gives us a sense of security 
and if there's a routine at home that helps a child a lot and we can enlist the support of extended family or even other parents because i'm sure that you would have had support from other parents uh, in uh, managing the children's school work and other activities then giving some control to the child involving them in household activities so they also feel they have some control over this uh, situation in these uncertain times and we have to model emotional intelligence resilience and flexibility so we have to show that uh, we have to manage like we have to take care of ourselves and manage our emotions and um, actions and if we do have uh, difficulties we can of course get support and there is formal support available from the sri lanka college of psychiatry they have a hotline for healthcare workers who are having issues especially in this context of the covid pandemic so i just wanted to present another couple of thoughts one is on overprotectiveness and neglect i know we feel like protecting our children because we want the best for them and we don't want them to like experience certain suffering that we have experienced so we try to really protect them and um shield them from these negative influences but like i mentioned before unless they experience these problems and um these conflicts they will not develop the necessary skills for resilience as well as problem solving so we need to balance this overprotectiveness and also neglect sometimes we might be very busy that we are not available emotionally especially for our children so that's also something we need to avoid because if children don't feel supported then they are unable to develop skills in emotional regulation and also self confidence so if we go back to the circle of security um representation the um overprotectiveness especially comes up in the upper half of the circle where the parents might not allow the child to explore because they are very overprotective they don't want any harm to come to the child and the lower half of the circle is where when they come back the parents might not be emotionally available i mean neglect is also a component of the upper half because even when children are going out to explore they want someone to watch their back so if you are not there if you are neglectful that part is also compromised so um on the one hand we want to give everything to our child and because we have seen a lot of child abuse um accidents illnesses in children we try to protect our children so we might go a bit overboard on that sometimes on the other hand because we are busy we might not have emotionally like we have we might not have enough time to be emotionally available for the kids and then we might also like spend money rather than time with our children out of guilt and feeling that we are not doing enough for them so we should try to get a balance between these two extremes because to feel safe and secure children need to know that they someone has got their back and also that someone cares enough to be in charge so someone is there to set limits as well and i thought i'll present this paragraph from circle of security parenting because i uh, think it's very important so what they say is that attempts to overprotect our children doing our best to keep all difficulties at bay robs them of the capacity building necessary for resilience a skill set that can be learned only within a context of shared problem solving and understanding support in the face of less than ideal circumstances because most of our circumstances would usually be less than ideal so we need to let children develop these skills if they are to manage them successfully as adults then finally i want to just mention briefly about high expectations and competition i guess as uh, doctor parents we do have certain expectations from our kids we want them to do well in their studies and even from schools the culture is that they expect children of doctors to do well and nowadays um, the academic uh, performance is not the only thing so you need to you know 
make your children excel in there's a lot of pressure to make your children excel in multiple arenas be it sports singing music and um, also studies and um, that can uh, create a lot of stress because especially if you fall into that competitive environment with other parents where you know when they boast about the child you also feel compelled to boast about yours then unknowingly you are creating a lot of stress for your child and also for yourself because if you go out and boast that your child can do this really well and if he or she isn't doing it then you become you know anxious and you might criticize the child and that would uh, impair the child's self esteem because then the child might think that he or she cannot do anything on his or her own so it's important that we have age appropriate expectations and also expectations that are appropriate for the child's skills so uh, children might be different and more than winning or being competitive the most important thing is that children learn to uh, develop the necessary skills uh, rather than the than then becoming first and if we try to like remove ourselves from this competitive environment we are also fostering uh, in our children the ability to take like be happy about other people's achievements because if you are always competitive it's will invariably be jealous of other people's achievements and then that would transmit to our child and jealousy is not a nice emotion at all so if we want our child to you know feel happy within himself or herself then we have to support them to find happiness in other people's achievements and at the same time develop at their own pace so that they can achieve their full potential so going back to my initial slide so when we come home from work like i said this is where we might end up but we should try to go here so here you can see that the parents are emotionally available the father especially but the mom does look a bit upset isn't really engaging but she is also available so we have to try we might not get it correct 100% of the time but what's important is that we try to do it and the take home messages would be we should be emotionally available for our children like i've been repeatedly saying and we have to provide a secure base for their exploration we have to set limits and boundaries have realistic expectations and learn to reflect on our own feelings and actions and most importantly we have to remember that we all have what it takes to be a parent these were my references thank you so specifically the recommendations are that we try and maintain a routine and structure at home so we should have that control over what's going on of course we have to be flexible we have to give time for the children to play and do other activities but we need to have a routine and structure so bed times times to wake up and do their school work and we have to also try and get them involved in other activities if possible if they like to do other things like uh, cooking and other gardening so that they develop some other skills and then we can also try to spend uh, time with them we might need to make a specific arrangement for that sometimes because uh, of the changing schedules and all but we have to make a conscious effort because now they are just stuck at home especially during this uh, significant uh, restricted uh, restrictions in traveling 
and uh, there are a lot of complaints and there are also the risks of them getting into uh, habits that are less than ideal. For example, you have had a lot of children coming with issues related to um, using um, excessive screen time. So the parents have to have some control over those things and also offer alternatives to the children because we can't just tell them not to use screens. But we have to sort of try and be creative and depending on our resources and the skills of our children, we might need to find some activities that they enjoy. And we have to also try and keep a close liaison with the school because we don't want, sometimes children tend to miss out on a lot of work and then become really stressed out. We have had instances like that where because the child was not wanting to engage in schooling, they might have missed out and then they become really stressed out. So we need to get that some additional support as needed also. Three questions do that here. Uh, one question is how can we balance parental responsibility or fairly when both parents are doctors? <laughs> so that's what uh, I was telling in the Canadian studies also, they have actually said that um, the male physicians tend to rely more on the female partners for the um, uh, sort of house domestic responsibilities and they have recommended to take an active sort of effort to uh, share the responsibilities more so I guess that's uh, it's an individual decision so but uh, it's also important that both partners respect each other and uh, come to a compromise uh, and you know because it's, the children belong to both partners so it's important that they try and come to a compromise where they are able to support their children but of course that's those are individual decisions because we can't give say that it has to be 50 50 it doesn't so and another question i think uh, it is like uh, about single parenting what advice do you have for parents who are parenting alone due to death divorce geographical separation etc as single parents, how can you manage? Yeah, so problems? single parents do have that uh, added uh, responsibility because they have to do a lot of work. Um, but still, it's uh, possible to get support from extended family, especially, say, if uh, you want a good male role model for your son and you are a single mother. So there might be uh, extended family members who are supportive. So it's important to reach out. And uh, it's also important uh, to have, like, if your partner is still living, it's important to have a uh, cordial relationship so that the child doesn't feel caught up between the parents' struggles because that can be what is even worse for the child because the child then has to take a side. So it's important that we try to work on those things. And you especially. mentioned about some support systems available. So yeah. uh, if they have like specific problems, they can reach out for support. No? Yes, yes. Especially in the context of the COVID pandemic for healthcare workers, uh, the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists do have a hotline that they can call. And if uh, you want, you can check on the Facebook page or the website. The details are available. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to ask you that uh, particularly with regard to teenagers and not, uh, how does it affect for them for not having the fear uh, in a situation? Yes, that's a very difficult situation for them. Even for the smaller kids, the peer relationships are important, but even it's even more so for the teenagers because now they are trying to, like, uh, they're, they're in that period where they are transitioning into adults and as adults, they have to go out into society and being in contact with peers is very becomes increasingly important for them, and especially in the current context, there have been a lot of problems. But uh, some have worked around it by having WhatsApp groups and uh, allowing uh, the children to have contact over the phone or other means. Uh, 